everyone, this is Jason Kendall. Welcome to the next of my introductory astronomy lectures. Today we're going to talk about the exploding stars, the biggest stars in the universe. It's how they live, how they are born, and how they die. Again, let's go back and we can go back to look at the, the fiducial idea. The top area shows exactly how the sun evolves from a protostar. It has a long main sequence lifespan of about 10 or 11 billion years. It swells up into a red giant, puffs off its outer layer to the planetary nebula, revealing the core as a white dwarf. And we see these things from the left-hand side, which is a star-forming region with a horsehead nebula in the middle. And then uh, in the middle picture, we've got a globular cluster in the lower right and a beautiful open cluster in the open left, which is the remnant of a new batch of stars. And over on the right is the ring nebula, which is a planetary nebula surrounding a tiny, tiny, tiny white dwarf star that illuminates it and causes it to glow by ionizing. But that's a story for stars like the sun that live about 11 or 12 billion years. We're going to look at more massive stars. Hot stars, like O, o and B type stars, basically their masses are greater than about four solar masses. They burn extraordinarily hot. They live extremely fast lives and they die very young. So their main sequence phase, they do burn hydrogen to helium in their cores just uh, through a different process, not the proton-proton chain, but through the CNO cycle. They also build up a helium uh, nugget in the core for their, for their main sequence phase because that's the definition of a main sequence phase is hydrogen to helium burning. And they do this just like any other star. The main sequence is where stars burn hydrogen into helium. So, but, this, but for high mass stars, this lasts at most about 10 million or so years. So let's look at one of the more fiducial stars of this type in the sky. You know it by sight in the stars, but this is an artistic uh, view of the star Betelgeuse. And Betelgeuse is a nearby supergiant red star uh, in the constellation of Orion. This is a beautiful piece of artwork by El Calzada at uh, European Southern Observatory. And this is a wonderful picture by Bavak Tafrishi of, of the constellation Orion above the very large telescope array down in Chile. And so what we see is we see the belt of Orion up there. And because we're in the southern hemisphere, Orion's inverted. So just above the telescope, the bright red star is the star Betelgeuse. And Betelgeuse, this is, part, this is a picture, is a massive, uh, uh, not an artistic picture, but rather, this is a match, massive uh, array of pictures put together as a mosaic by Rogelio Bernal Andreu, uh, and it was featured in Astronomy Picture of the Day in 2010. So Betelgeuse is the upper left shoulder of the giant of Orion. And there's all sorts of wonderful things going on in the Orion Nebula and the Orion area of the sky. But Betelgeuse is the star we're going to be talking about. Betelgeuse is a red supergiant star. It lies in the upper right area of the HR diagram with a spectral type of M and a luminosity of about 100,000 times that of the sun. And, it compare, and it's, much, it's about the same temperature as little red dwarf stars on the main sequence or giants like Aldebaran, but it's much, much, much larger. And Betelgeuse is brighter, and we call it a red giant because it's brighter at red wavelengths compared to blue wavelengths of light. And so this is a sample type M type star that we might get from a, I forget exactly where, oh, I grabbed this from uh, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. And this particular thing shows an M type star, and the wavelength band is from 4,000 angstroms to 7,000 angstroms, which spans the visible light. So to your eye, this is the this is the part that is visible to your eye. And so I kind of blew out, I kind of grayed out the rest to the right. But you can see it actually glows a lot in the infrared. But for visible light, it's brighter in the red wavelengths than it is in the blue, and has striking absorption features and so forth. And because it's bright in the red compared to the blue, that's why it looks red in the sky. Now we can also judge it's whether it's a giant or a main sequence star by looking at these absorption features of the dips from the continuum. You can imagine that this is actually some sort of continuum that goes over the top with lots and lots and lots of dips that go through. So where the peaks are is where the continuum is. So you could draw a line across the peaks of the continuum and then imagine that it's actually that the absorption lines are huge absorption lines down from the peaks where the peaks go up to the continuum. And so you see they're very, very, very wide peaks, uh, very wide absorption features. And if they're really, if they're comparatively narrow lines when there's only one or two, then it's called a giant star. And if they're wide absorption lines, then it's a main sequence star because main sequence stars are compact. 
So therefore, they have a lot more Doppler broadening. The atoms and molecules are moving faster. So therefore, the widths of the lines are broader. And in a giant star, the widths of the lines are narrower because the pressure is lower. And because the pressure is lower, there's less movement of the atoms, and the atoms can't absorb, at, can only absorb it there near the frequency where they're absorbed. But if they have their high pressure, they're moving faster, and so you can get Doppler shifts for the, uh, the absorption. Anyway, so from the spectrum, which gives you the width line widths, and the color, which gives you the temperature, you can deduce that this is a supergiant type star and of spectral class M. Now, how do we know it's really that big? I mean, what we can do is remember, we can also take, if we have a handle on the luminosity, remember there's a luminosity relationship for the Stefan Boltzmann relationship, where the luminosity is equal to the surface area times the temperature to the fourth power. So if we have a way of measuring the absolute luminosity of it somehow, and then we know roughly it's radius, then we know it's temperature, which is obvious from the spectrum, then we can determine its radius and determine it's an extraordinarily large star. And that's the Stefan Boltzmann relationship. Anyway, we do know that Betelgeuse is an extraordinarily rare star because it's a more massive star than the sun. So roughly less than a couple of percent, like two to four, like, like almost three or four percent of the stars in the sky are even as mass or could be as massive as Betelgeuse. Uh, actually more like about a 1%. So Betelgeuse is probably much more massive than a two to four solar mass star. So we're really looking at the, the deep, deep, deep little blue sliver where we have a four to eight or 10 solar mass type star, which is about 1% of all the stars in the sky. And Betelgeuse falls in that realm. It's not one of the small mass stars between one and two or a half or a quarter or less than a quarter of the mass of the sun. It is in that elite category of very, very, very massive stars where so few of them in the sky are that massive star. Now, Betelgeuse is about 152 parsecs away, or about 500 light years, and the luminosity is about 120 times that of the sun. So it's extraordinarily luminous. And that puts it, oh, this is a really fun statistic. The absolute wattage is about 4 times 10 to the 26 watts. And if you compare that to what human civilization puts out, which is about 17 terawatts, uh, you know, we, we, we're nothing compared to the luminosity of Betelgeuse. We're nothing. 10 to the 14th times less. Oh, my goodness. And the Betelgeuse, Betelgeuse itself is about 1,200 times that of the sun. That comes, from the, that comes from both direct measurements, as we'll see in a second, as well as the Stefan-Boltzmann relationship. And we know that 100 Earths fit across the sun, but about 120 Earths fit across Betelgeuse. That means that it's bigger than the orbit of Jupiter. All right. So... Let's take some interesting looks. This is the, a 7 millimeter radio image taken with the Very Large Array down at NRAO. And it was taken in 1998 by Lim Corelli White and Beasley and Marson. And they found that the optical disk of Betelgeuse is this roundish sort of thing in there. But the glow that we see here is a radio emission. Radio emission from Betelgeuse's very diffuse atmosphere. We see that Jupiter's orbit would easily fit inside of this atmosphere of Betelgeuse, and so Jupiter would slowly spiral in. And we see that uh, another thing about Betelgeuse, it's not spherical. It's a, not a spherical star. So people thought, wow, that's really interesting, 1998. So following up, and not well, prior, prior to that, uh, Betelgeuse was measured in terms of, in terms of its physical size, with the Hubble Space Telescope image of a direct imaging by, by Dupre and all its Center for Astrophysics using the Hubble Space Te Telescope. And this is a direct image of Betelgeuse. We see that the star is actually quite large. It's much larger than Earth's orbit, much larger than Jupiter's orbit. So Betelgeuse is this enormous, enormous, enormous uh, physically large star. Now, the European, a group at the European Southern Observatory took a series of images and then place them inside uh, it, using the VLT and, and infrared imaging as well as optical imaging to try to determine the actual dimensions of it. And if we take the little red dot that's in Dupre's image from before, it would just fit inside that red circle, just barely. And you can see that there's kind of plume-like structures that are visible in the infrared. Now, the right-hand side, this plumey sort of thing is an infrared image. Remember these, these types, as we saw gently in the other spectrum that we saw before, that the vast majority of the emission from this star is actually in infrared. So because it's a cool, hot, it's a cool, large star. And since it's cool, the dominant radiation is infrared. 
Well, it's also puffy. There's a plume shooting off to the side. There's also other plumes kind of noodling around. It's a really distorted thing, and it's not actually spherical the way we think of this, like the sun. The sun is spherical, but we can really think of Betelgeuse as not even spherical. It's just this pumpy sort of thing. And it's an incredibly sharp, Im sharp image. This was taken by the Very Large Telescope in Chile, which is that uh, set of telescopes that we saw from Babak Tafrishi's image from before. And we're actually seeing this unknown plume to the right. What's funny is, is the individual pixels are as small as 37 milli arc seconds, which is about the same size as a tennis ball viewed from the ground at the International Space Station and is all near infrared imaging. And if we then zoom out with the v a different infrared camera and again with the VLT at ESO, we see the black disk is the thing that is used to occult the star because the star is incredibly bright. It's one of the brightest stars in the sky. And so to actually get the image of material surrounding it, you need to actually block it out. And the, di and the previous image was put in the center and the disc-like image that we see from Dupre's images is the red circle in the middle. And now we zoom out to show the full grandeur of this of Betelgeuse, which really doesn't actually seem like much of a star anymore. It seems like a star nebula thing sort of thing. And if you actually were to take a spaceship and fly over near Betelgeuse, you would find that you'd fly into this cloud-like structure that got brighter and brighter and brighter towards the center. You'd fly by globs of mass that's moving out with enormous winds that would buffet your spacecraft as you tried to get closer and closer. And eventually you'd find yourself in an incredibly bright, foggy mist and get closer and closer to the star. And you would just all of a sudden be close to what would be bright enough that we would call the photosphere. So many of the absorption features that are found in Betelgeuse's spectrum come from this expanding shell of gas, and of gas that comes off of the star itself. So Betelgeuse is shedding a lot of mass. And just like we saw last time in the low mass stars, how we had a star like the sun puffs itself apart and forms a planetary nebula, Betelgeuse isn't waiting. It's not done yet with its life before it starts really puffing itself apart as, what, as all high mass stars do. And that means because it's puffing and moving, it's variable. So it's an actual variable star, which is easily seen with binoculars. So if you want to go out in the night sky and take a pair of binoculars and see what the variation in magnitude is, this is the this is this has come from the American Association of Variable Star Observers. This is their this is their data, and it's compiled by a number of observers. And these observers then uh, submit their data to Ameri the AAVSO. You can become a member too. It doesn't, doesn't, doesn't cost you. Well, it costs you a little bit, like 20 bucks a year. But then you get to submit your data into this set and you can make meaningful science measurements just with binoculars, specifically of this star. But as you can see, the star varies if we, as time progresses from left to right. We see that the brightness and magnitudes varies varies pretty big. It can vary up to a magnitude in brightness. As you can see, roughly about 2008 or 2009, it was pretty dim. And then it brightened from, mag it went as dim as magnitude one. And by about a couple of years later, it was as bright as magnitude 0.01, almost a zero magnitude star. And it's been brightening and dimming by about a half, by a quarter of a magnitude fairly regularly as it puffs itself apart. So Betelgeuse is an extraordinarily variable star, and it's fun to observe. So I would invite you to use this as one of your primary variable stars if you want to observe them and do some science in your own home. This is a great way to do it. And you can learn how to do this by going to the American Association of Variable Star Observers. You don't have to become a member to submit your data, but they always appreciate that you do. All right, so stars themselves can be extraordinarily big, as we've seen in the past. The sun is only about 700,000 600, 700, kilometers across. And so on this image, it's really tiny. And the bright star Arcturus, which is in the constellation of Bootes, is much, much, much larger than the sun, almost three, uh, almost uh, uh, almost uh, 20 times larger, 30 times larger. Uh, yeah, about 30 times larger. And if we then look at red, the red supergiant Antares in, in Scorpius, it's extraordinarily large, larger than the orbit of Mars. And so these are the red supergiants. So red supergiants exist like Betelgeuse. So how do they live? Well, they're so big. They're so massive. So you know, a large physical star like red supergiant 
isn't doesn't mean it starts like that. It started as a main sequence star and swelled up. But while it was on the main sequence, it burned hydrogen to helium. But it does not do so. But these massive stars, any star more massive than about four times the mass of the sun, is does not use the proton-proton chain to fuse hydrogen to helium. It uses the CNO cycle. It is a, it does fuse four protons. You can see the equations. These set of these are a set of um, a set of, uh, of reactions uh, where a proton P combines with a carbon twelve nucleus. They collide together. And the arrow says the output is a nitrogen-13, uh, or a light nitrogen nucleus, and that emits light in the form of a gamma ray. That's what that little Y-E sort of image is. That's a gamma, gamma ray. The next step is this light nitrogen nucleus, then beta plus decays, from, which means that one of the protons turns into a neutron and therefore emits a positron and a neutrino. This can only happen inside the nucleus of an atom. It can't happen as a free proton, but there it is. Of course, then the positron uh, interacts with an electron to form a gamma ray as well. But then the carbon-13 then collides rapidly with another proton, which forms nitrogen-14. So we're back to nitrogen again, and that emits, car that emits light in the form of gamma rays. And then that nitrogen slammed, gets slammed by a proton, and it forms oxygen-15, which itself is radioactive and unstable, falls apart to nitrogen-15, which is, which is briefly stable. And that emits, again, another pro positron and a neutrino. And then that gets slammed by another proton. And that forms the, the chain, which returns it back to a carbon-12 nucleus, and that spits out a helium nucleus. So we can add all this stuff together, Basically, six six things go. Sixteen objects. One so the proton could be something about one in the upper left. So sixteen things go together to make a carbon twelve and and the helium. But notice that the carbon twelve acts as a catalyst. It returns back to the beginning of the cycle, having been used up, and the intermediate processes of creating nitrogen and oxygen along the way. So it doesn't really go anywhere. So it acts as a catalyst. And that catalytic uh, reaction uh, keeps the carbon going, and it actually and this is uh, this is an incredibly important element. So for the sun, the sun does a little bit of this. About two percent of the sun's output comes from this. But once you get above one point one solar masses, or just a little bit more massive than the sun, CNO is about fifty percent. But why, once you're up to about four solar masses, it's about it is a hundred percent. So by two solar masses, you're doing a CNO cycle completely. Now, this is, of course, inefficient, but it's really interesting to return to the idea that what does fusion energy give you? Remember, when you fuse one gram of hydrogen into, into 0.993 grams of helium, it loses mass. Some of the mass of the four hydrogen nuclei, those four protons, gets converted into energy. Less than a percent, about seven-tenths of a percent of a gram gets converted into energy. And for every, every single one of those things, that provides six times 10 to the 18th ergs, which is a large amount of stuff. And that's a huge amount of energy by comparison. Just to do this one interaction, that was enough energy to list to lift about, about 30,000 tons, well, 64,000 tons of rock up to a height of a kilometer. So basically, just fusing one gram of hydrogen into helium is enough energy to take a building and throw it into the air about a mile. That's what, that's what fusion energy gives you. So if someday we can, can figure out how to do this safely and efficiently, we could replace uh, all, pretty much all of our energy needs with fusion if we can figure out how to do that, which would be pretty cool. Anyway, so just like low, main seat, low mass stars, no party lasts forever, and every star, no matter what it's big, uh, big or small, population, uh, population uh, one type stars, which are young stars that have come from reprocessed material, have roughly about, by abundance, is about 10% by numeric abundance is helium, but then about 90% by abundance, meaning the number of particles, is about 90% of the particles are hydrogen. And about 5 billion years into its life, the sun has only converted about 10% of its hydrogen in the core into helium.
And by about 10 billion years, the sun, the sun specifically, now we're talking, not talking, just going back to the sun just to get reference frame, the sun will have converted all of the core material to helium and a significant fraction up to about half the star's core will be helium. Now, that's what happens in the sun. A very similar thing happens in, the sta in every main sequence star. It builds up this nugget of helium in the core, and when that runs out, it's over. And it doesn't matter whether it's using the proton-proton chain, which is the upper left, or the CNO cycle, which is the upper right. That's, those are the two dominant ways that hydrogen gets fused into helium inside of, star, inside of stars on the main sequence. That's the way it's done. There's other things then will come later, which is the triple alpha process. We described that when we talked about the sun, when the sun started dying, and that happens too. But that's not the, that's, even that doesn't last. Helium fusion doesn't last because you run out of stuff too. Anyway, so what will happen to a massive star that is way up the main sequence, that's an O and B type star, when it starts to run out of fuel and it uses up its hydrogen in the core? Once it's exhausted, it does the same dance that the sun would do. The inert helium core contracts down and starts heating up. There's again the hydrogen burning shell around it and around that contracted core because pressure, 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 gravity pulls the star together and the only and it just gets compressed and compressed and hotter and hotter, but it's not participating in fusion because it's not hot enough yet. So hydrogen burning or hydrogen infusion is in the shell around that nugget in the core. And then this huge puffy envelope gets to expand. So these red supergiants, unlike the sun, which just kind of lazily goes up. Now, these shoot straight across to supergiant phase and they get enormous, radically enormous in, in a very short period of time, less than a million years. Now, the funny thing is, along the main sequence, stars don't have a huge radius difference. Pretty much an O-type star in the main sequence is just only a little bit bigger than the sun on the main sequence. The, the radius isn't that much bigger. But once, it, once a massive star runs out of hydrogen, it swells up much larger than the sun will ever get. The sun will never become a supergiant, it'll become a giant star. But these stars become supergiants. Eventually, the, the star, the supermassive star, gets the core temperature <clears throat> raises to about almost 200 million Kelvin. That's enough to start up helium burning. And helium burning through the triple alpha process, as we showed before, that makes carbon and oxygen. That only lasts, we're, we're in the sun, this would last about a billion years. For, the, for massive stars, it lasts about a million years or less. And then we've got this layering set that happens down in the core where there's helium burning in the core, then there's hydrogen burning around. And notice that there's no helium flash because now it's going to be there, when it ignites it, it ignites it smoothly. Stars more massive than about two and a half times the mass of the sun don't have a helium flash, meaning the star never, the, the electrons do not get so compressed in the core that they become degenerate. And degenerate, the degeneracy never occurs for, for stars more massive than two and a half times the mass of the sun. And they just kind of, they just, it starts burning very, very, very gradually. So much more massive stars simply move, wag back and forth, and they get bigger and smaller, bigger and smaller, hotter and cooler, and they don't get, they, st they stay at that extraordinary luminosity, but their temperature, their surface temperature changes. Now remember, the HR diagram shows the surface temperature. So the surface temperature of a supergiant star ranges between, say, 3,000 Kelvin and maybe 20 or 30,000 or tw 10 to 20,000 Kelvin. That's a blue supergiant. A blue supergiant isn't really that blue. It's more whitish because it's kind of the same temperature as an A star. But I guess an A star is kind of bluish. Um, it would be bluer than, a, bluer than the sun. In any event, uh, it becomes a blue supergiant when the core temperature, when the helium ignition uh, it starts and then it, start, it smoothly moves back into this new framework. So it, that's producing more energy, which is producing a little bit more luminosity but that allows the star to actually collapse back down. All right, so the helium, when the helium finally runs out in the core, and that doesn't take long, that takes an extraordinarily short period of time. In fact, it doesn't get down to the horizontal giant, horizontal branch at all. It just kind of wags back and forth. When it runs out of a unset of helium in the core, then the carbon and oxygen core collapses and heats up. And that's a big deal 
because now the hydrogen helium are acting are burning in shells around it. And it becomes a super giant again. So it does this whole dance all over again. Notice how the size of the star is dependent upon the what's happening down in the core. When the star grows in size, it grows in luminosity. And it's growing in luminosity because the energy output that must occur is getting very, very, very high in the core because there's no new energy source. It's contracting under gravity. It's running out of fuel. The, te the atoms and molecules, the atoms, they're not even atoms, they're, not, they're just ions. They're, the nuclei have to move insanely fast in order to find other nuclei that they can fuse with because they're running out of sources of things to hit. So therefore, the temperature has to rise. To, in, when the temperature rising means that things are the particles are moving faster and they have to move faster because they have to go farther in order to find something in order to hit in order to make the fusion so that's that's kind of what's happening so eventually the carbon oxygen core co continues to collapse it gets smaller and smaller and that releases more heat by gravitational collapse because as you collapse a gas it releases the heat and eventually the core temperature exceeds 600 million kelvin and then the density is insanely large. It's about up to 150,000 grams per cubic centimeter, which is a thousand times more dense than lead or gold. So a typical, a typical gram, a cubic centimeter of gold might weigh a kilogram. But this star, which is a gas, will weigh 150, 150 kilograms for, per cubic centimeter. And it's still a gas. It's just really bizarre. It's not a solid, even though it's much more dense than lead and gold, a thousand times more dense. Finally, we can get to the point where carbon fusion can occur. And then we get all sorts of reactions. Carbon burning is a new set of reactions that happen for much more massive much stars that are much more massive than the sun. Carbon can slam into another carbon nucleus, and that forms magnesium. Neon can slam into helium, and oxygen can slam into double. It can slam into two helium nuclei, and that builds up an oxygen neon magnesium core. Now, the oxygen neon magnesium core is also inert because it's not hot enough to fuse oxygen into anything heavier than that, and so. These are so carbon 12 12 fusion creates the products of magnesium or neon and high helium or oxygen and helium. Those are its byproducts when carbon 12 smacks into another carbon 12. This doesn't release a lot of energy because remember, the, it takes a lot of energy to make them initially, and each larger nucleus that you get gives off less and less energy. So you got to do more of it, and there's less of it to do. So you have to do more of it. There's less of it to use because now we're knocking together fewer objects because they're all combined together and you get less energy out of it. Hmm. So this can't last long. And so the reaction rate must be higher so that it can stay. So the star can stay aloft. So carbon burning, burning can only last about a thousand years before it runs it out. And that's roughly where Betelgeuse is now. We think that Betelgeuse will one day explode in a supernova, which I'll talk about later and next time. but it might be within the next thousand years or 10,000 years or a million years. So where Betelgeuse is now, it has an inert carbon, an inert oxygen, neon, magnesium core. Very rapidly, there's a carbon burning shell happening fantastically quickly around it. Above that is it's hot at that and there's nothing in there except that. The, height, the helium then mixes through and that creates helium burning in the shell around that. And whatever protons are left that are just on the boundaries of that burn in hydrogen, fuse hydrogen into helium. So the helium burning shell makes helium, which descends into the helium burning shell, which makes carbon, which descends into the carbon burning shell, which then descends in carbon burning, creates oxygen, neon, and magnesium, which descends below. And all above the, the, uh, the super giant envelope, it's very, very, very unstable below. It's puffing off its outer layers, just like we saw initially with Betelgeuse just puffing itself apart because the interior is an extremely violent place. So carbon, oxygen, neon, magnesium core is about what stars between the masses of about four and eight solar masses will ever do. That contracts and contracts and contracts. That core of oxygen, neon, and magnesium contracts. And it basically, that contraction releases even more heat 
and that pops the entire and creates those shell burning around it, which is incredibly unstable, which pushes the star apart and makes it froth. Now, these are the low end masses of stars that will end up making what we call Cepheid variable stars. Cepheid variables run between about five and 20 solar masses, and Cepheid variables will become incredibly important when we study the Milky Way and we study how we can find the distances to the cosmos. So these are the, the progenitors, and this is the time of life where some of these massive stars become Cepheid variables when they pass back and forth into the upper left area of the HR diagram above the main sequence. So these kinds of stars eject all their stuff, and we saw just like we saw Betelgeuse doing, and they leave a white dwarf behind, just like we saw with the sun in the previous thing. So a, a massive, super uh, heavy-duty stellar wind coming off and leaving a core behind, a white dwarf probe with a large planetary nebula. Much more massive than that, at least eight times the mass of the sun. Then carbon burning can happen. The carbon burning evolution is insanely quickly. It'll happen less than a thousand years. And the star's envelope has no time to respond to that. And there's a big thing that's going to happen really soon. However, there are incredible, strong, stellar winds that can be shown that are evident from these massive stars, and they can erode the outer envelope, pushing it outward, making enormous bubbles and burbling appearance to the star. And Eta Carina, which, uh, which is one of the great examples of such a massive star, a star much more massive than eight times the mass of the sun. I believe that Eta Carina is about 20 to 40 solar masses. And we see from this Hubble Space Telescope image of the burba of the nature of this particular star, which is Eta Carina, which is clearly undergoing some violent stuff. These bubbles demonstrate that the star is incredibly variable. It's puffing off its outer layers incredibly violently. And this can't last, of course. And so this star is in the course of dying. And very, very, very soon, it will do something very catastrophic. And one that when Eta Carina finally goes supernova, you will be able to read by it at night. So for much more massive stars, the oxygen neon magnesium core contracts and contracts, and it still and by contraction it releases gravitational energy, gravitational potential energy, then heats the heats it up to a one and a half billion Kelvin. I mean, how do you even get past what that is? Okay. Uh, I, I really can't give you a handle on what one and a half billion Kelvin is like, but let's just say it's bloody hot. And the, te the density is now about 10 billion grams per cubic centimeter or 10, uh, almost uh, well, 10 to the 10, 10,000 kilograms per cubic centimeter. These are extraordinarily rare conditions. Remember that massive stars, extremely massive stars, make up the most rare of all of the stars in the cosmos. So even though they're incredibly bright, they're, they're quite rare with far, far fewer than 1% of the stars in the sky will ever do this. So neon, I'm not going to really go through all the reaction rates because now they get extraordinarily complex. And the neon there, when neon burning occurs, it will create more oxygen, more magnesium, and lots and lots and lots of other heavy elements. Now we're below the element iron. Now, a lot of these reaction networks, remember the, the carbon, nitrogen, oxygen created neutrinos, as well as all of the carbon burning that created the oxygen, neon, magnesium, that created enormous numbers of neutrinos. And now most of the luminosity of the star becomes in neutrinos itself. And the star rapidly creates this core. And neon burning can only last a couple of years before it runs out. And But neon does not provide, it provides even less energy than the previous step. And so you got to, there's fewer particles. It provides even less, even less. The temperature is even higher. So the reaction rate is even faster. Neon go, is done in a couple of years. When you're done with that, well, what the heck? What's next? Well, you burn oxygen. Oxygen then starts fusing and raise the temperature rises rapidly into, uh, into billion, about 2 billion Kelvin, and the density rises even higher in the core. Remember, this is still a gas. This is still a gas, and it's still gaseous because the temperature is so high, even though it's 10, almost 10, 000, 20 or 30,000 times more, well, 10, 10 or 20 million times more <sighs> dense than water and 10 or 20,000 times more dense than, than lead or gold. 
But this temperature finally allows oxygen to be fused into silicon, sulfur, phosphorus, and pretty much everything up until iron. Now, most of these things, uh, most of these reactions uh, have enormous numbers of neutrinos uh, because there's all sorts of, many of the reactions uh, create uh, huge numbers of neutrino, uh, neutron, neutrons, which then decay rapidly. These rapid decay as neutrons then get captured and also create nutrient neutrons as well. So there's multiple different reaction processes that are happening in the star. I'm not going to really talk about the S process or the, the, the fast process or slow process, the R or S processes, because that gets even more complicated. But suffice it to say that the star, one of these last days, the neutrinos losses are much more, there are more energy coming out of neutrinos than there are in light. Now it's building up a silicon core. So silicon is still is now building up, and this lasts for about a year. Finally, oxygen runs out. The silicon core contracts, and it heats up till it goes even higher in temperature and even denser, over 100 million times the, uh, that of water, the density. And finally, in, when, it, when silicon burning occurs, the temperature is so incredibly hot that the silicon itself cannot withstand the intensity of the light that's there. The, the photons are so incredibly energetic at this temperature that they actually break the silicon apart into helium again and back down to protons and neutrons. So the silicon is getting destroyed by the light. And then the rest of the silicon is fusing into nickel and iron. That, that doesn't decay yet. This builds up an enormously heavy nickel and iron core, which will last only for about a day. So the, nutri the temperature of the star, the, the luminosity of the star is incredibly large, but yet it only lasts a day. And here's, our, here's nearly our finishing picture. Uh, at the end of this life of this supermassive star, more than eight times the mass of the sun, there's hydrogen burning shells, helium, carbon, night, neon, oxygen, silicon, and all of these fusion shells where each layer is raining material down on top from above down below as the gravity, as the pressure pushes it in. And, but yet down in the core, there's an iron nickel core, which is doing nothing. The size of the, shell, the expanding envelope due to the instabilities down, happening down in the core is now bigger than the orbit of Jupiter, just like we see Betelgeuse being. And that and the reason for this iron nickel problem is what we call the nuclear impasse. Now, why are we caring about this? This is what's going to happen. This is why there's a big, 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 big problem. When you fuse light elements together, you release energy. You release energy in the form of light and you release energy in the form of neutrinos. But iron is the most tightly bound of those things. So you get energy by fusing light elements into heavier elements, so long as the elements are lighter than, have, have an atomic number. Less than 26. Which is iron. So they release energy, but if you want to, if you want to fuse elements heavier than iron, it must absorb energy. So once an iron core forms, there are no fusion reactions left for the star to tap in order to release energy. So gravity's still working, and that's what's happening. And here's a view of that thing again. Below iron, fusion will give off energy. Above iron, fusion takes energy, or more specifically, fission gives off energy. So that's why we use uranium in order to power our nuclear power plants, because uranium falls apart. And as it falls apart radioactively, it gives off energy. And that's what the far right-hand side shows. But we're talking about stars. We're talking about massive stars. And that's and it's, they all try to go towards iron because iron is the most bound of all the nuclei. And if we look and zoom in really close to this binding energy, we find that it's specifically iron 56 and, and nickel 56, which are the most bound nuclei of all. And this, we see that this reaction network shows how much energy you get out with the largest jump in energy coming from hydrogen up from on the far right hand, left hand side. When you start with hydrogen fusing to helium, that's the biggest step. When you fuse helium into carbon, notice the step from helium four to carbon 12 is really tiny. And then the step from carbon-12 to oxygen-16 is small too, but is much smaller. Again, from oxygen to neon, you, it's this teenier step. 
And so each step is smaller and smaller and smaller until you get to iron. So each step of this fusion reaction gives off less and less and less energy as it goes until you get to iron and then it takes energy in order to fuse it because that's what the curve means. So that's the end of the road. At the end of the silicon burning day, there's just an inert iron core with some, with some nickel in there too. And there's this huge onion skin of burning shells all around it. And very soon, the iron core exceeds about one to two solar masses and begins to contract and heat up. And what it does at the end is final, catastrophic, and amazingly bizarre and wild. That's the end of the road for these stars. And stars between uh, masses between four and eight times the mass of the sun, they, be, they burn all the way up to carbon. And anything less than four solar masses only burns helium. And the cores of these intermediate mass stars become white dwarfs. Anything bigger than eight solar masses gets all the way up to iron and does a catastrophic collapse. And what happens then, we'll talk about next time. See you soon. <laughs>